morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Amen. Welcome to our worship service this morning. For those of you joining us, perhaps for the first time, my name is Pastor David Mummins. Welcome to St. Paul's. We're glad to see you here as we celebrate, um, celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ in our church in exile. I uh, streamed live here through Facebook this morning. Uh, a couple quick announcements before we start our service today. Uh, first of all, we're going to continue doing our Bible study on 1 Corinthians on, on Zoom, which is a thing. Uh, and if you'd like to have access to this Bible study, um, please uh, turn into our Facebook page around 11 o'clock. We'll have the link posted there. Otherwise, send me an email. Um, our contact information is on our website, and then you can get access to this, this Zoom meeting and join us live face-to-face for this wonderful time in Bible study. We're going to keep working our way through 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and hopefully get into chapter 2 today, but we'll see how that goes. That's the goal. Uh, secondly, um, secondly, if you'd like to follow along for our worship service today, we're using Divine Service Setting 3. That's Setting 3 out of our hymnal. Otherwise, you can go to our website, um, stpaulsmeadows.org slash service folders, and you can download the service folder today, which has everything printed, hymns, the whole nine yards, it's all there available for you. Also, uh, historically, if this was like a, a regular year and everybody was together like we'd like to be, uh, today would be the last Sunday of Sunday school. And on the last Sunday of Sunday school, traditionally at St. Paul's, we celebrate by having ice cream sundaes and then throwing a party for the kids. Um, but since we are all socially distant from one another, and you're at home and, and we're here, um, parents, I encourage you to get ice cream sundaes for your kids today um, as their Sunday school lesson, um, and teach them a little bit about how much Jesus loves them. So that's your Sunday school assignment today. Go and eat ice cream. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, and lastly, um, so this coming week, um, on a personal note, I will be taking a vacation um, this week. So if you need, if you need something... Go ahead and call the office. I might not get back to you right away. Um, and if it's not an emergency, I probably won't respond to you right away. I'll be out of the office from Monday through next Sunday. It's taking some time off. Um, our service today is going to be based off of our second reading from First Peter. Um, that'll be our spending our time together talking about why, why are we disciples. It'll be a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful look at this text. Otherwise, we'll follow our service as is printed for you. Uh, we'll start by singing our first hymn, number 816, From All That Dwell Below the Skies. I pray the Lord's blessings on your worship this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of my boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our intro at today is taken from Psalm 119, and we read it responsively. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, 
with the Holy Ghost, heart most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Our first reading today comes from Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, and he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took hold of him, and they brought him to the Areopagus, saying, we, May we know this new teaching that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived with, would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I have passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. When therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live upon the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and, and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us, um, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And all of this has been given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, and this text will serve as the basis for our sermon today. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, regard Christ and Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. So that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. Hallelujah. 
the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I, I believe, believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in singing our next hymn, number 779, Come My Soul With Every Care. Please be seated. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who loved you with his very life. Amen. Alex Honnold um, is known for, for free soloing. Uh, free soloing, pardon me. Uh, you can easily find pictures of him. They're all over on, on motivational pictures of him climbing a rugged cliffs suspended there high above the ground. And what's interesting about these, these pictures is this tension uh, between the struggle of the rock climber and this inspiring and beautiful sighting in these pictures. And, and looking at the rock climber, uh, we can see Alex uh, with only his hands and his feet holding him to the stone as he free climbs. He, he doesn't use ropes. 
Uh, his body leans into the rock. His hands are, are lodged in crevices, and his face is close, pushed against the stones. And, and looking at the setting, however, we can, we can see what on earth would inspire him to do something like this. And there it is in these pictures, the, the vast expanse of the rock jutting up into the, the sky. This, this beautiful expanse of blue and, and clouds above him and the deep and varied landscape of the hills below. And in one picture, uh, we see this, this tension of, of free soloing. Alex's vision is, is limited, but his struggle is intense. But the world is much larger than his limited experience, and he's, he's part of this beautiful creation that just evokes awe in a sense of those who get to see it. And although Alex himself is, is not a Christian, his experience is similar to that of what it means to be a Christian. Discipleship is difficult. The struggle to be a disciple is intense. And we find ourselves drawn into this difficulty of discipleship with our, with our face pressed against a wall of rock. And we need one small glimpse of, of the larger vision that inspiring view of the landscape that carries us on. In our text this morning, uh, St. Peter writes a letter to churches, and he offers them that, that glimpse, that inspiring view to keep them going. See, Peter, when he's writing this letter, he's, he's writing to churches in, in lots of different settings scattered throughout the ancient world, you know, places like Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and, and Bithynia. And while these are different churches and, and different, different parts of the empire um, with different, different cultures, one thing is common among all of them. They are struggling. They're all having difficulty with discipleships. As Christians, they struggle with, with how their faith interacts with the world around them. And Peter's letters offer them an inspiring view. He offers the, the larger vision of God's glorious work in Jesus Christ, the vision that helps them persevere to the end. And so we will meditate on Peter's words this morning with the goal that, confident in Christ, we will be encouraged to endure the difficulty of being a disciple. Christians can, can sometimes in, interpret suffering in their life as if, as if something were wrong. Uh, Bill and Janelle were having trouble with their friends. Um, they've been part of this group of, of couples for, for years now. Their children had been in scouting together. They'd watched their kids play in, you know, in everything, in soccer games, baseball games, basketball, volleyball, and so on. They'd celebrated graduations from junior high, high school, college, and now they're celebrating weddings and the birth of grandchildren. But suddenly, it seems, with all of those happy years behind them, it, it seems like things are changing and suddenly everything's becoming, well, for lack of a better word, political. Um, events reported on the news become sources of arguments between these groups of friends. Bill and Janelle try to articulate how they as, as Christians would react, um, but their faith was putting a strain then on their friendships. Bill and Janelle were wondering if they could just keep their faith to themselves. Maybe, maybe we're doing something wrong, Bill once said. Ha having friends uh, that you can be honest with, it, it shouldn't be this hard. But it was, and it is. Uh, when our Lord called us to follow him, he called us to take up our cross. Discipleship is not easy. Not now, not then, not, not ever. Satan would tempt us to believe that we are doing something wrong, to believe that the Christian life should be easy, and if it's not, to believe that we should just be then quiet about our faith. Peter, however, in our text this morning, offers us a different vision through the rocks. Peter encourages us to always be prepared to make a defense to anybody who asks you, who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have that's in you. But do it with gentleness and respect, as he says in verse 15 of our text this morning. But why? Because we know the power of God that is ours in Jesus Christ. Peter offers to us a way of dealing with the difficulties of discipleship. And Peter encourages us to look to Jesus. When we think of, of, about the disciple, about the, the man Peter, uh, we often think about the things that he did. 
We remember how, how Peter, he wanted to get out of the boat and actually walk on water in the storm to Jesus. We remember how, he, how Peter wanted to, to build, build booths, to build tents on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. We remember how Peter boldly claimed that he would follow Jesus unto death. If you must die, I'm going to die with you. And then how he just a few hours later denied Jesus three times there in the courtyard. Remember how, how Peter preached about this, this amazing sermon about Jesus on Pentecost, which we'll look at very soon in a couple weeks here. Peter's life is, is rich and, and varied. You might think that Peter could, could give us some advice from, from his life of discipleship. Be like me. But Peter doesn't do that. He doesn't ask us to consider the things that he's done as a disciple. Instead, he asks us to consider the things that he saw as a disciple. At the end of his letters, um, chapter 5 of, our, of First Peter, um, Peter writes this, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Peter wants to be remembered not for all of those, those bold things that he said or not for all of those bold things that he did, he wants to be remembered for what he was. He was a witness to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And as a witness to the sufferings of Jesus, Peter has seen something very important, something that he wants to share with other Christians. See, Peter has seen how God entered into suffering and triumphed over it, how God is able to use suffering in his kingdom Suffering is not something that's insurmountable for God. As, as Peter writes to Christians who are suffering in their discipleship, people, Peter reminds them that God works salvation through suffering. He says in verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous suffering for the unrighteous, that he might bring us closer to God. Through Christ's sufferings, sinners were brought to God. Without the sufferings of Christ, we would remain in our sins, separated from God by, by what we say, by what we think, and what we do. But because of the sufferings of Christ, of the sufferings of God himself, we are, we are separated from our sins. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross, the wrath of God has been satisfied. The righteous one has died for the unrighteous, that we are now members of the kingdom of God. Christ Jesus himself took on suffering. He struggled with the powers of sin, death, and the devil, and he died that you would be saved. And he rose from the dead that we might know that nothing can separate us from the love of God and nothing can overcome God in this world. Jesus Christ is able to enter into suffering and work through suffering to bring about the reign and the rule of God. So although our situations of discipleship are difficult, uh, we can endure them with confidence because of the work and the nature of God. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, is able to enter into suffering and to use it for his purposes. We therefore need not fear or flee from situations of difficulty, but rather we, we follow our Savior, confident in his power. There is this, uh, this engraver and, and painter who, who lived a while ago back in Germany, um, his name is Albrecht Aldorfer, Al, <laughs> Aldorfer if I can say that right. Um, and he's known for his ability to, to juxtapose these, these biblical scenes against those bright and, and vivid landscapes. In his work, uh, you see Jesus and his disciples in the midst of, of moments of suffering. Yet around them, in these, in these pictures in time, is juxtaposed these these large and glorious landscapes full of bright and vivid colors. Such a juxtaposition captures the tension of Christian living. Suffering for the faith always occurs within a much larger vision of what God is trying to do in the world. There's one painting in particular that stands out. Um, and he depicts Jesus um, praying there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this, this painting is, is both powerful and, and, and instructive. In the painting, you see the disciples there in the front of the picture in the foreground. Uh, it's Peter, James, and John, and all of them are sleeping. Peter, he, he leans against a rock um, with his back to the scene. John is, is laying there sleeping on his back with his mouth wide open. And James is looking downward like he'd just fallen asleep. 
And then behind them in, in the painting, um, in the center of the painting, is, is Jesus. And he's kneeling right before, right on the edge of a cliff. Um, he's being administered to by an angel flying down from heaven and bringing him a large cup. Um, it's the cup of suffering that Jesus says he's going to drink. And finally, much further in the distance, uh, behind Jesus, we see a, a delegation. And they're coming hard to see out of the background, lit with fires and torches, led by no less than Judas himself. And we see these religious leaders in the temple guard, and they're coming to see Jesus in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane. But what's amazing about this painting is the way that it's been arranged. And where the figures are, it teaches us a lesson. The disciples are very obviously in this painting in a compromised position, and they're hopelessly defenseless, fallen asleep there in the garden. John is, is actually lying on his back, facing those who are coming to arrest Jesus, yet his entire body is just left wide open for attack. And yet there, between the armies that come and between the disciples, is Jesus. His prayer is their defense. His willingness to bear that cup of God's wrath is their salvation. His weakness, his willingness to bear the wrath of God are the power of God that protects his disciples. Because Jesus stands there between the disciples and the forces of darkness, nothing will be able to come to them that has not first come through Jesus. Jesus is the victor. He's triumphed over all evil in his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. All suffering that comes to us has already been conquered by Christ. In his letter in our text, uh, Peter gives us a glimpse of this glory of God. He, he relates to the churches how Jesus was not only suffered for their sin, but how he rose from the dead in victory over all that is evil. He descended into hell to proclaim his victory over the powers of hell. And then he ascended into heaven and now sits at God's right hand, the hand of power, where he rules over all things. This is your larger landscape. This is your larger vision. When suffering enters into our lives, when difficulties endanger our discipleship, Peter encourages us to see the whole painting, to see the larger vision of our risen and our ruling Lord. See, God, God calls us to see our lives in the light of death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what's it like then to endure the difficulty of discipleship with, with confidence in Christ? Well, one last thing. Consider for a moment Melissa. She's a college student. Um, she is not, uh, she's chosen not to be quiet about her faith. In a writing class where students are asked to journal responses to reading assignments, um, she uses this journaling time to express her faith. She reflects on how she, as a Christian, would respond to these assigned readings. And her journals have not always been well received, but she tries. And she tries to write with gentleness and respect, as Peter encourages us. But through argument with other students, she's learning to get better at that as too. But she remembers what it's like to be back in, in confirmation class back when she was in eighth grade. Her pastor had her, her read a personal confession of faith standing there before the congregation, and she remembers being so nervous way back then. But now, however, that just seemed so simple, talking to other Christians about your shared beliefs. And that's nothing compared to sharing your faith with those who do not believe or with those who stand against what you believe. Little did she know how important that lesson way back in confirmation class would become to her. Faced with this difficulty of discipleship there in college, she finds confidence in Christ. She struggled to put her faith into words, trusting in the one who suffered and rose, and now even rules over all things for her. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds forever in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our service continues uh, with the singing of our offer offertory. It's found on page 192 in your hymnals. Please rise.
spirit within me cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy holy spirit from me restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the faithful proclamation of Jesus Christ to those who do not know him, that through hearing the word of the Lord, many might be brought to faith and to the knowledge of truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church of God, here and everywhere, that all who confess Jesus Christ may be united in doctrine and witness, defended against all the assaults of the enemy, and eager to gather together around your word and sacrament in love for one another. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this parish, for the work of the kingdom in our community, and for the resources to accomplish all that God desires, that his name might be glorified among us, and his purpose fulfilled in our words and in our works. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the agencies and institutions through which we love our neighbor and provide for those in need, for the destitute and homeless, and for everyone who suffers unemployment and underemployment, that we might aid them in their needs and assist them to find honorable labor to supply all of their needs. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the lonely who suffer the burdens of life without friendship or family, for those depressed and wearied of pandemic measures, and for the fellowship of the church, that we might bear one another's burdens and live in community with Christ as our head. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and for those who suffer, especially for Ethan, um, who has heart problems as he is hospitalized in the children's hospital, for Dave, who is hospitalized with an infection and a high fever, for Alan's uncle Wayne, who has liver cancer, for Aunt Arnie, who has a broken hip, and for cousin Tom, who could be on a respirator, for those on the front of this congregation, and for those who name before you in our hearts. That God would grant healing to their bodies, peace for their minds, and consolation in their grief and sorrows. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For love of godly things, that we might delight in God's word and walk in his ways. For the spirit, that we might be led in all truth and kept from all error and false doctrine. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for those who lead our nation, for the end of this pandemic, for peace among nations and for an end to terror and violence we may work for the common good so that justice might prevail, that life would be protected and truth abound. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, our God, as we recall the obedient life and life-giving death of your Son for our salvation, we pray you to strengthen our faith and to make our hearts bold, that we may not fear, but address our prayers to you in all humility. Hear us on behalf of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who even now stands before you on our behalf, pleading our cause with his own blood until that day when we are delivered from the charges and changes of this mortal life and stand before you in heaven, to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We join together in praying Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. We join in singing our closing hymn number 842, Son of God, Eternal Savior, you may be seated. Oh, 